Welcome to Viva Physical Media, episode 26, what? if you can even believe it. If you can believe it. Do you guys listen to that uh, every Friday, David Lynch's little uh, weather report? I watch it sometimes. He goes, every Friday, he goes, if you can believe it, it's a Friday once again. <laughs> and he says it exactly the same every Friday. It's a joy. <laughs> Did we already say our names? I'm Emily. I'm Kevin. And this is Viva Physical Media. Oh, okay. So who... Hopefully you clicked on the right link. Yeah, hopefully you weren't trying to watch like a trailer for the next Marvel movie or something. Right, because that's not we're not going to have that. Wait, maybe I'll put a clip in right here. Oh. There you go. <laughs> okay, um, so last Saturday, which is the next, it, it's not your last Saturday, but it's for us, uh, was Whoa. Video Store Day. Yeah, the 16th. Yeah, the 16th, yeah. and it was awesome. Yeah, we did a whole uh, another uh, live stream. Uh, I'm sure some of you were watching, so thanks if you were watching. Thanks yeah. if you were watching and you donated or bought some stuff. and Or stopped in the store and said hi. Or stopped in the store and said hi. Yeah, that was awesome. Yeah, we got to actually see people in real life, listen to some live music, which I haven't I haven't seen live music in like a really long time. It was That's cool. true. I hadn't thought about that. Yeah. That I was like, this is like the first concert I've been to since everything sort and of it was locked just down. Right at Scarecrow. <laughs> and it was just at work. We talked to Ken Jennings mm -hmm. via Zoom, which was really cool. We yeah. drank zombie cocktails. We did, yeah. Matt came in and made us some cocktails. Uh, the other Matt and Travis stopped by, so we did a little suspense. Ah, suspense is killing live. us. Uh, uh, thing. Uh, it's up on our YouTube page, so if you if you have uh, if you want and you want to scan the eight hours of us uh, live streaming, or if you're a psycho and want to sit down and watch the whole thing on live stream, <laughs> if you're uh, if, that, if you <laughs> if you are, that's then that's good. That's what we want. Yeah, yeah. That's their fans, right? Totally. Our biggest fans. Cool. Very cool. Like in that like like in that movie Misery. I never saw how it ended, but she seemed like she was really cool and she or liked like his the books. Movie, uh, swim fan. <laughs> So yeah, we still have the psychotronic challenge going until the end of the month. We do, yep. And I you, think you'll this, have a few more days when this comes out, maybe. This will be out like Halloween weekend, so Ooh, who fun. knows which day on Halloween weekend, though? Maybe the day before. Maybe yeah. Halloween day itself. Oh my what god! What a treat or a trick? A uh, trick and a treat. It was a little tricky a little treat. Both. Our coworker Jensen in the store. Or if you see him on the internet, uh, be sure to tell him thanks because the psychotronic challenge is his brainchild. Yeah, and like we de we love it when people are playing along. So um, yeah, keep keep it oh, going. Oh, also on Video Store Day, uh, if you're lucky enough to get your hands on it, we had these shirts. Yeah. Uh, these shirts designed by our coworker Will, who always does an awesome job with the art stuff. I'm so glad I snagged a couple of these at the beginning of the day because these flew fast. Um, do you know if we're gonna get more? We probably aren't. We still have uh, as 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 of this recording. Uh, we still have small, some smalls and mediums. Okay. Uh, but so, we're out of large and extra large. Yeah. Um, and I don't, I can't say with confidence whether or not we will be getting any more. It is limited, so that's sort of the, sort of the, the game too. But yeah, um, if you're a small or a medium, or if you're like crafty and want to like cut it into like patches <laughs> and shit, order some or come in the store. Yeah, come get, come get some. We still have, we still yeah. have some and they're rad. And they have and all the so. categories, all the little sections yeah. in the psychotronic room down the sleeve. Yep. Um, and they're comfortable and cool. It is very comfortable. Yeah, we would have mailbag, but you guys aren't emailing us. Yeah, there's no mailbag today. And I would love if you guys start emailing us again. <laughs> yeah, just even say like, hi, we'll read it on the air. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> we will read it. We'll read um, it. Yeah. I, we st I still want, I want to, I'm going to, once again, we're going to request uh, pictures of your dogs dressed. Yeah, it's about to be Halloween. We would love to see some, some dog Halloween costumes, or if you're dressing up as a movie character, that would also be awesome to see. Yes. Um, let us know what you've been watching. Ask us, ask us for any recommendations, or if you have any questions about the store, shoot them our way. Viva yeah. at scarecrow.com. Or if you want to write us any fan mail or send us anything, uh, yeah. 5030 Roosevelt Way, Northeast Seattle, Washington, 98105. I always, I always. I know, right? It's right towards the end. Up. It's like, how am I messing this up? Yeah. Um, but speaking of like fan art. Right. We got some fan art we got uh, some cool stuff. on video store day when we were talking to the, the guys from uh, Kaleidoscope. And one of them, Michael, was like, hey, I did this a while ago and I meant to uh, bring them in, but I 
I hadn't, and so here they are, and he presented them to us live on the air, and it's some uh, some more beautiful fan art. Uh, <laughs> I love just it's all the de it's about the details here, <laughs> about the the respelling of my name without actually trying to block off the the mistake. <laughs> um, my hair looks great. Kevin's hair looks great. My hair looks, yeah, this is as good as my hair is going to look for the rest of my life is in this drawing. Uh, we're both just cradling <laughs> Rainiers. Yeah, we're both holding little Rainiers like I babies. Love it. I have my re-elect, my one-of-a-kind re-elect Frank Sabatka shirt on. And I have my <laughs> salmon-colored velour button-up. I already know which one it is. Uh, um, yeah, yeah, these are, this is, it was a surprise and really awesome. It was, yeah, if it was you a legit haven't, surprise. If you haven't, if you don't know about Kaleidoscope, check them out. Yes. They do a lot of super fun stuff and are... If this is out before Halloween, then and you need plans, you should and you need plans. Check out the Egyptian. Should go to the Egyptian the, and check out Kaleidoscope. Show also on mine. There's uh, the, uh, my eyes are googly eyes. Googly eyes. Yeah, he said he said he tried he put googly eyes on mine, but they didn't look as it good, so work. he just gave me long eyelashes, which I love. That's way better. Uh, so thanks for the fan art. Um, you know, uh, yeah, I don't know. I got um, anyway. <laughs> <laughs> Whoops. I think we had some sound issues. <laughs> yeah, sorry about that. Uh, I mean, I, I probably edited all the uh, bad sound issues out, but one of our mics uh, decided to uh, not be good anymore. It lasted 26 glorious episodes. Yep. <clears throat> R.I.P. 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 Uh, one of the mics. We'll remember you. So now we have the one here, so uh, sorry if it... Anyway, apologies if sound is weird. <laughs> Yeah, um, we're, we're, work, we're working through it. This is a guerrilla production here, mm -hmm. it's, uh, so that's how we like it. Diva at scarecrow dot com. If you yeah. do want to send us email, and seriously, like you know, get, let's get those let's get those uh, dressed up pooches on this on this uh, yes, fucking thing. <laughs> Um, let's get these dress up pooches on this fucking thing. Yeah, exactly. Uh, truer words have never been spoken. <laughs> um, so yeah, that that uh, was what we had to say about mailbag. Yeah, there you go. So should we? Do we need to end since we're going into a new segment now? No, that's a good end. All okay. right. It's awkward, but good. All right. Woo. So um, last year, you guys may have remember, since we've been doing this for a year now, which is yeah. crazy, um, <laughs> we had Rich give us his little, his, his review of, he does a marathon of a horror movie from every decade. Yeah. And, uh, which is insane. And he does it all at like one day yeah it's all one day well he's here he's gonna be here to talk about it yeah and so uh here he is here's rich not so, yeah. talking about a cat movie but talking but about maybe but maybe yeah we'll find out all right take it away hey everyone it's me not the other cinephile today uh but yeah as my uh co-host not really i don't know i'm not really a host uh as the host of, of, of the uh, viva physical media said yeah Every year, um, I watch 14, now it's 14 because we're in the 2020s, but 14 horror titles, one for every decade available, starting from 1890 to 2020s, all in one day in a row. Uh, this year it took 20 hours, and I started at 10.30 a.m. and finished at 6.30 a.m. Yeah, I know, right? Uh, and I'm just going to talk about, go down the movies real quick. So we're not here all day. First movie was from 1897, and it's not really a movie because it's 1897, and movies didn't happen yet. All they did were shorts, and mostly two to five minute ones. And so, actually the first two, uh, the next one being from uh, 1903, they're both by Millier. Arguably, this one here that I, that I chose from 1987, The Haunted Castle, is considered the first horror film ever made. Uh, when Melee's made it, it wasn't made to shock or to scare. So when you watch it now, you, you're, you're like, this isn't scary. And it, it's not. It's just weird and fantastic. It's basically a three-minute short about these two uh, cavaliers who go into a castle. They meet Satan. Satan conjures uh, a couple things to scare them. Uh, and they run away. And uh, they find a cross on a wall and make Satan go you know, back to hell. But thumbs up. It's really good. So I, I really recommend it. Uh, as I also do uh, 1903, uh, same guy, Milliers, uh, doing The Monster. And this has a little more plot to it. And, 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 and the interesting thing about when Millier does these things is they're only two, three, four minutes long. You can actually get kind of a story. And in this case, a lot of these were supposed to be made when they were shown. They are actually supposed to have uh, a narration and not just the intercards. Or, or, or that you see in, in, in silent movies. There's actually supposed to be someone there narrating kind of a beginning so it kind of sets up 
uh, a plot. This is a very simple one. It's a, uh, the backdrop of this entire two minute thing is the Sphinx, it takes place in Egypt. And so in the 1900s around now, uh, in Europe, uh, Egyptology was very huge. People were, were just obsessed with anything Egyptian or exotic. And uh, Millier is totally, uh, you know, just banks on that with this one. And it's basically about a guy who wants a dervish to resurrect his dead wife. And he does, horrifically, uh, and also kind of lies about it. And, turn, and she turns back to a skeleton, and he runs away after him, and it's over. So both of them, really quick uh, and good. And I recommend both of them. They're both very good. Then we move to 1919. Uh, first of two, I don't know why I did this to myself, but I did two two-hour silent German movies, both starring Conrad Felt, which is good because he happens to be a great actor. He's probably best known for The Cabinet of Dr. Kagari, uh, which is also in 1919, and he did this movie also in 1919, which is the very first ever horror anthology movie. So congrats to them. Uh, it's called Eerie Tales. Uh, it's five tales, and it's bookended. Uh, it starts with, uh, it's a book dealer in a rare bookshop. And then at midnight, he has these posters on the wall, one of the devil, one of death, and one of the whore. And at midnight, they all three of them pop out and kind of go through the books and start reading. And then the stories that they read are now what you're, you're seeing. And the three of them also star in each of them. So it's, they, they star in all, uh, all five parts. And they're, they're hit them. It's five parts, just like any anthology movie. It's not... Not every one of them is great. The first segment is the best one because uh, it's just very creepy. Uh, I'm not going to go into each one. But overall, uh, Eerie Tales, pretty good. But again, this is a two-hour long German silent movie. And then, just to make it fun, I did 1924's The Hands of Orlock, which is another two-hour German silent movie starring Conrad Filt. Obviously, this is more narrative. It's one story straight through. It is also very good. It is German expressionist, so it can get a little boring for some people, I think. A lot of uh, just long shots on things that maybe they could have tightened that up a little bit. But hey, you know, it's 1920s. What are you going to do? But it's good. Also, uh, I recommend it. Then we have 1934's Rawhide Terror, which is a horror comedy western. And it sucks. The first uh, thing you notice that it might suck is when I'm watching it and the credits are rolling. And it says, directed by A.V. Adamson. And I'm like, hmm. Is this guy related to Al Adamson? And he is. It's his dad. And they both suck at making fucking movies, turns out. <laughs> it's a slapdash mess of just terrible acting. It's, it's so low budget. It's low budget for the 30, so figure that out. Um, I mean, it's, the acting, it, it, it's worth it to see because the acting is so bad, it's on that parody level. Like, if you're going to pantomime a bad actor, like, make one up, like, what does a bad actor do? Like, oh, I'm dead. Ah, uh, it's that kind of stuff. It's real hokey, but luckily it's only like 40 minutes, so it's in and out real fast. So that kind of sucks. Then we did 46's The Spiral Staircase, which is fantastic. It is uh, Robert Simodiak, uh, who's well-known uh, director, um, although I can't think of anything that he else has done. Kevin, anything? Nope. Yeah. Uh, uh, we, we look like terrible. Anyway, here's his own section of the store. Viva Physical Media. Viva Physical Media. Oh, no. Spiral Staircase. Um, it's one of those movies that it's uh, called a thing that hardly plays any role in the movie until the very end, and it really doesn't even have to be called that. But the Killers! It could be called The Killers, yeah, exactly. Oh, it could the be Killers, called... that's great, yeah. Yeah, it could be called anything. It's based on a book called Those uh, They Must Watch, or Those oh. Must Watch, or something like that, which is a better title, I think. This movie is somewhat considered uh, maybe one of, the, one of the very early gothic films. Uh, it does have a, it's not completely gothic, but it does have a lot of the angles, a lot of the shadows. It's very noirish. It's, it's actually a mixture of gothic and noir kind of mashing together. Basically about a, a murderer who is killing women who all have some sort of disability. And the main character is this woman who had, in her past, she had this, um, you know, an event that caused her to lose her voice. So everyone's worried that, oh, you're going to, you're, you're on this guy's hit list. So you know, don't leave this house. And that's the thing is like, no one could leave this house. The men can leave this house and they go into town and stuff, but there's three ladies who are in this house and none of them are allowed to leave. One is bedridden and the other two are trying to leave the whole time and they just can't. It's almost comical. Long story short, you know, four stars out of five. Really great, I highly recommend it. Uh, lighting is fantastic, the acting is great. It's just really good. Uh, 1957's Lake of the Dead, which is the very first Norwegian horror film ever made. 
it sounds like it would be a zombie movie. It is not, unfortunately. That's what I was kind of hoping for. Uh, but actually, it's a Norwegian legend of uh, this entity that lives in lakes and tarns and whatnot. And, you know, uh, kind of beckons you and tricks you to get into the water and pulls you into the water and drowns you. You know, it's, it's, a, it's probably a common folklore idea from many cultures. But this is about the uh, Norwegian version. And it's great. It's really good. It, it takes itself very seriously. It's not like it's made in 57. And, you know, you know, we're making a lot of B movie horror films in this country in 57. And this is Norway's Nor very first one. And they they put their main stars in it. Uh, it is well done. It is smart. Um, it probably plays better for a Norwegian audience to hear the actual Norwegian language. Uh, the translation probably doesn't come away all the way. But you can tell they're actually having these very smart discussions about superstition versus science, which is kind of the theme to the entire film. It's not a particularly scary movie, uh, but it does have its moments. So, so I'd give it, you know, a good three out of five stars. 1967 is next with Even the Wind is Afraid. Uh, and Kevin came to my house and, and watched this one with me. He came by. True. This was a lot of fun. I enjoyed this one. Uh, it's your standard uh, all women's school. Bad things are going on. What happened in the past is the... Uh, you know, the current headmistress and teacher involved with some nefarious past murders or something. Maybe our, our, our Nancy Drew sleuths will figure out because they're all, they all got uh, suspended and on and on to leave for vacation. So they're the only ones on cabins and they keep seeing ghosts. Uh, so someone's going to figure out something, but it's pretty good. Uh, Kevin, did you like it? Yeah, it's fine. Yeah, there you go. It's, it's fine. A lot of nice, a lot of nice costumes <laughs> with those ladies. Exactly. Oh, oh, yeah. The colors are very bright. Uh, all, all, all prime colors, very uh, reminiscent of something like Suspiria, mm -hmm. or the way uh, you know it's used there, or um, Rear Window, or Vertigo. Yeah. You know. Uh, then we moved to 1970s, The House That Would Not Die, which is a made-for-TV movie, uh, uh, produced by Aaron Spelling, who was you know just the guy who did TV and movies at the time. Um, a little slow. Uh, I wouldn't recommend this one for everyone to run out if you want to see a really good Aaron Spelling made-for-TV movie. I would hold out for something like Haunts of the Very Rich or uh, A Cold Night's Death. Uh, both those superior made-for-TV movies that he's involved with. But if you're a completist, uh, this is his very first one. I get a lot of firsts in this list. This is the very first uh, Aaron, uh, Spelling uh, produced made for TV horror film from 1970. So, you know, it has some pedigree. Three out of five. All right. Next, Road Games, 1981. Yeah. Five out of five. Just a great. Uh, basically, imagine Rear Window, but moving. And so instead of uh, in Rear Window, where he's, you know, looking out with the binoculars at all the different uh, apartments, it's, uh, it's Stacy Keach, and he's a truck driver, and he's driving along with his pooch. And he keeps saying the same people because they're all going the same way. So it's like, that's the thing. Is like he, he keeps saying the same, he, he keeps passing the same families and stuff. And so it's like, it's like looking at the same neighbors. But at the same time, there might be someone out there who's murdering women, hitchhikers, and disposing of their bodies on the side of the road. Uh, and he picks up a very young Jamie Lee Curtis, and together they're going to solve a crime. Uh, side note, the murderer is actually played by Grant Page, who has no dialogue in the film. Uh, but is uh, a very well-known stunt coordinator and stuntman in Australian filmmaking. And if you haven't seen Stunt Rock, just stop what you're doing and go out and watch that. Because it's all about Grant Page. It is insane. Uh, let's see what's next. 1995's Mute Witness. And this was probably the greatest surprise in that I went into this movie not expecting anything. And this movie fucking rocks. Even after I've been talking it up for a year? Well, I, I mean, that... <laughs> I mean that 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 said, but I'm not but also not knowing myself, yeah, you know what I mean. I and so you go into it, and I'm like, this movie is fan fucking fantastic. Just stop this video now, go watch Mute, Mute Witness, and then come back and watch the rest of it. It is that good. Uh, it is a story of a mute, you know. There you go. Uh, a mute effects worker, a uh, few effects artist, uh, working on a film that's a little bunch of horror movie that's being made in Russia. And, you know, the movie opens and she's working there and you get everybody involved. Like her friend is, uh, her boyfriend's friend is the director and he's kind of a douche. She's more friends with her friend. Um, her friend's the only person who knows sign language. She's, she already has one level of language barrier. Meanwhile, everyone else is also speaking Russian. So there's now two levels of language barrier. And it's, it's a really fun way to get, like if you make a movie now, a horror movie now, you got to find a way to make sure everyone's cell phone doesn't work. 
right? Because it's like, well, why don't they just call someone? And so this puts her in this spot where she can't call for help in various situations because no one's going to understand her or hear her. And also, strangely enough, this movie is probably the closest movie that evokes the horror survival genre of video games, if that means anything to you. It is astounding how it really represents that. And um, it's really nerdy and, 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 and very, you know, um, what's the word I'm looking for? Uh, very niche, you know, kind of thing. But it blew me away just how much I was like, you're, like this is just like a game. Uh, it is fantastic. It is always escalating. It never slows down. It is just one pitfall scene that she gets herself into and gets herself out of just to get into another one. It is it is awesome. I can't I can't recommend this enough from being this like unknown film to me to just astounding. Six out of five stars. Uh, mute witness. Next movie, two thousand one's Saint John's War. Now. I specifically watched this movie because I wanted to watch a shitty J-horror movie from the early 2000s, and this did not let me down. It is a shitty J-horror movie from 2001. And not only that, it is, it is actually literally based on a video game. And I don't know if it's just me, or my bad eyes, or the graininess of the film, but it looks like they really tried to merge the idea of video games with this. So like the backgrounds and sometimes some props and things, I couldn't tell whether if they were actually there or just you know cgi'd or just there but just totally like a bad filter was put on them to make them look like they're almost cgi'd i don't know the movie's bad i do not recommend saint john's wart unless you're some sort of weird j-horror completist and then you got to watch it uh if you want to know um saint john's wart doesn't play into it at all by the way uh it's a plant if you didn't know it kind of looks like parsley doesn't matter it's growing around big deal doesn't matter it's a it's basically about this uh a bunch of kids who are making a video game. One of the females finds out that her parents had, that she's kind of estranged from and doesn't really know well, passed away, and she inherited a very big mansion. They go to this mansion to check it out. Turns out her father was this very famous painter that painted all these very violent uh, paintings that are all like very bloody and stuff. And then they find out that, oh, he used real victims as, you know, subjects and Maybe she has a twin sister that exists that she didn't know, et cetera, et cetera. Anyway, it sucks. Don't watch it. Um, negative one out of five stars. Uh, the penultimate film of the day, uh, which is around four in the morning. This is also the time I took a shower, in case you <laughs> want to play along with how I rolled. Uh, Apartment 143, which is a Spanish film, but all in English. Uh, found found footage movie because I always gonna have a found footage movie because I have a weird soft spot for these movies. So I like this one more than I think your average person will because again, I kind of like these kind of movies, and it also isn't full found footage. It does have scenes of, well, basically it's about an investigation of this haunted or demonically possessed apartment, and so you have scenes of the family dealing stuff, and then you have scenes of all the cameras they place around because they want to record all the rooms because it's like an investigation, a paranormal investigation, a la you know like Poltergeist. You know, the teams come in, they set up their cameras, all their equipment, and for the next hour and a half, they're basically testing things and doing stuff. But it's actually, it's very smart because it, uh, the, the guy who plays the main investigator really comes off with some gravitas. Like, you kind of believe this guy knows what he's doing, and he repeatedly talks about how, like, I kind of know what's going on, but we have to test everything because we're scientists. We have to, we have to make sure that, you know, it's not something else. It's not, you know, a, a bad faucet or pipes or you know some cat in the wall or something we have to test all these things and figure all these things out because that's important and anyway it, it, it doesn't do anything you don't expect a 2010s found footage movie to do it even ends spoiler uh with a really shitty jump scare um i don't know like a screamer as it would be as, as they're called on you know uh and PCs, like when you hit a link and you see something that's like, what's going on here? And then something just jumps at you. It's like, ah, and it, it's going to scare you. There's nothing you can do. It's real cheap. This movie ends on one. So just stop it before that happens. Uh, but I still give it three out of five stars. It's a perfectly cromulent, competent version of one of these things. And then finally, 2020's Friend of the World, which I doubt anyone's heard of. I never heard of it. When I plan these ahead of time, I look at lists of what are all the horror movies that came out in the 2020s. And I kind of go through by name. I, I very rarely look up any of these are when I watch them. I kind of just want to go into them all blind and cold because uh, I haven't seen any of them. And I picked this one because it was 50 minutes and I could find it online to watch. 
It's on Tubi for free. Viva Physical Media. Viva Physical Media. Yeah, sorry. Um, but there is no physical media for this one. It, this is no way, only say there is actually no DVD as far as I can tell or, or anything. Uh, but what this is, is the word lynching gets thrown around a lot. And I'm going to throw it out there on this one, although it doesn't quite get it, but it gives you kind of the, the mindset of it. It's a post a post-apocalyptic film, black and white, of a, uh, basically stars mostly two people, a, uh, a young woman awakes kind of in the middle of this like post-apocalypse and meets uh, like a, a very huge kind of burly man who uh, whose name is Colonel Gore. And he is absolutely ripped from uh, Stanley Kubrick's Dr. Strange Love. You know, he's totally kind of Sterling Hayden vibes, 100%. And he steals the show. They're both pr pretty good in it, but he is just cigar chomping, jingoistic, patriotic, uh, over the top, steals every scene. And it's basically about her trying to figure out what happened and if this guy who's they possibly are the last two people left on earth, there's a weird genetic uh, outbreak and a war that sort of happens. And so it's a little, there's a little bit of body horror in it and the effects are actually really good. They're, they don't happen very much, but when they do happen, they really put some effort into it and, and it actually works out. Uh, so I give, I give it props to be this thing, like there was a genetic, uh, outbreak, but then also a war. So it's like a double apocalypse. I don't know. It's weird. It doesn't make a lot of sense. It ends ambiguously, maybe not in the best kind of way where you're just like, oh, this is ambiguous. I get it. But no, this is more like ambiguous. What? I would give it three, about five stars. It's not terrible. And that was it. And it, at that point it was 630 and I was tired as shit and I went right to bed. So, uh... You know, some people watch a movie a day, you know, for for uh, Halloween, and I just like to do this dumb thing, and uh, yeah, I'll do it again next year. So, via physical media, happy Halloween. Oh, and I won't forget the doggy bag. Hopefully, my hair looked okay when I was on, on you look screen. You look perfect. Great. You look perfect. All right, so thanks, Rich, and your beautiful hair for giving us a rundown of your uh, your marathon again. Uh, I watched two of those movies. Perfect. I also. I also watched the TV there in Spelling TV one, which was about Revolutionary goat War Time Era revolutionary Ghosts. Revolutionary Goats? Ghosts. Ghosts. Revolutionary War Era Ghosts. Cool. Yeah. Um, I've seen a few of those. A few of those ones oh, that Oh, said. yeah. <laughs> awesome. Hopefully you got some recommendations from those. Yep. It's absolutely insane that you do that <laughs> for so many hours. Cannot even believe it. Yeah, I stopped by for like a few hours and I was like, well, I'm going to go I home and go, go to bed. Yeah. <laughs> so we have a, a, it's like a half new segment that we have. Yeah. Um, so over the summer, I was like, I'm going to do my raunch comms again. And I did some. Um, it's definitely not a consistent thing, but no. we are, I'm going to continue doing these raunch comms to give you the, <laughs> the content that you crave. Um, uh, but at the same time, Kevin, you're kind of branching into a different kind of calm. Yeah, well, and I had ha or earlier had kind of half-assedly started wa watching, like, uh, rom-coms, which is a blind spot for me. Yeah. Uh, and uh, it was, I think, spurred on partly by your, like, 13 going on 30 segment and some of that stuff. I'm like, you know, I haven't watched a lot of those, and some of them might be good or whatever. Uh, but, but, again, it wasn't. it never turned into a thing. So... In an, in an effort for us to whole acidly do two talk half, about two halves of an ass create one whole ass and, and that's me and Kevin and it's going to be <laughs> <laughs> so it's going to be our uh, what do we call it we're going to call it raunch versus rom raunch versus rom we're going to pin it down a little better in the in the upcoming so, episodes and it's not going to be an every episode thing this will be a little this will be a little loose right now but uh, this will just be so um, so it'll be Emily talking about some raunch a raunch com me talking about a rom com and i guess we'll pick a winner at the end i guess we will uh, or we'll pick two losers <laughs> yeah or maybe they'll both be winners. Or, or maybe the comment section should pick the winner. Ooh, yeah. Let us know if you want to be involved. <laughs> Let us know if our choice of winner or loser is wrong, I guess, too. Okay, so should I start with the raunch? Or should we start with the wrong? Let's just let's bring them both out, okay. and we'll just so we can have the contenders, so they know who's who it's versus. All right, in this corner of the ring, we have Body Waves, directed by PJ she from 1992. Already already kind of way ahead just by the cover of a dude surfing on boobs. Uh, and uh, generally, I think the Ronchcoms are going to have better covers. I think that's just going to... This is also a rental by approval only. VHS, Got to throw down yeah. a 200 RBA for this baby. Yeah. And it is a VHS. 
So, so in the other corner. In the other corner, I have something that is... Uh, I have a, one of the more middle-of-the-road rom-coms I've ever seen. A movie my friend Richard made me watch when I was in Portland. Definitely Maybe, starring Ryan Reynolds. <laughs> <laughs> so, Two uh, unlikely con- contenders. <laughs> Let's, who, who will come out on top? We're about to, we're about to find out. All right. <laughs> Body Waves. Uh, first off, the director of Body Waves also directed uh, Smoke and Aces 2, Sniper 3, and the second Lost Boys movie, Lost Boys The Tribe. Uh, I just want to let you guys know, Sniper 3 is really good. I, I, <laughs> okay, so this guy has a lot of, like, quality shit under his belt. Do you know who directed Definitely Maybe? Uh, it's somebody named Adam Brooks, wrote and directed. Basically, these two surfer bros, uh, one of which has a dad in, like, this corporate, uh, kind of, a corporate company who makes, like, creams? <laughs> <laughs> he makes like uh jock itch creams of like creams like that and he has a lot of money and he's going out of town and he's basically like son if you're ever going to take over the family business i need to know you're responsible can you earn three thousand dollars while i'm away and he's like yeah totally so he gets his like kind of stoner surfer br- buddy friend and they like basically invest in this multi-level marketing scheme to sell um suntan oil called oil slick so they try to sell it on the beach and no one is biting um, but they meet these three nerds and they convince these nerds to give them $3,000 if they can teach them how to, uh, meet chicks and get laid. But on top of that, they meet this girl and her mom runs this really cool indie radio station that is, uh, like being threatened to be shut down by the mayor because it's like plays rock and roll and is like anti-war. So they're like, well, fuck, we should also like try to get this radio station to be saved. So there's also the subplot of saving this radio station. What do you got? Definitely maybe. Uh, I did look up Adam Brooks' filmography, and he's mostly more known as a writer. He directed some stuff, but it's mostly TV. But he did write some... I'll read some of the ones that people might know. French Kiss. Okay. uh, Beloved. Okay. That's so good. Practical Magic. Great. Wimbledon. Anybody remember that one? I remember that one? Yes. Uh, definitely, maybe. And then the other stuff is all, is like some TV, TV stuff. Oh, Bridget Jones, Edge of Reason. Okay. He wrote that one, which Love is all the, the Bridget second Jones one, movies. I think. Yeah. Okay. Pretty definitely, random. maybe. What this is about is uh, Ryan Reynolds plays a guy. It doesn't matter what his name is. It's Ryan Reynolds. Who fucking cares? His daughter is Little Miss Sunshine. Um, and at the beginning, he's like, I'm, I'm uh, this guy who works at this business. Uh, I, I, I'm getting divorced. I'm a little sad about it. And his, his daughter is like, how did you and, you and mom meet? Uh, and he's like, well, I'll tell, I'll tell you the story. And then he proceeds to tell her the story. But the twist is that he's telling the story and he's, he's got like, there's like other, these three women in the story and he's changing the names for his daughter, so she doesn't know which which woman in the story he's telling is her mom. So she knows her mom in real life, and she knows her mom's name. But in the story, he's going like, here's how I met this woman, and this woman, and this woman. She's going like, but how do I, I'm trying to figure out, you know, so then it keeps <laughs> cutting back to her. And also, it's one of those where, like, he's telling the story, and then she has questions, and you're like, wait, was he telling her all of that stuff? Because that's, like, very detailed story, and also... And also Probably they do, not appropriate for, like, a little girl. Which they do point out a few times in the yeah. movie. The three women are played by Isla Fisher, uh, Elizabeth Banks, and Rachel Weiss. And they're all, you know, Rachel, uh, Elizabeth Banks is, like, his, like, his high school sweetheart, and he's gone into college. And so it takes place in the past, so it takes place when he's, like, a young, a young uh, eager, uh, like, guy who wants to work in politics. And he's going to go work on the Bill Clinton campaign. Okay. So he goes off to New York and leaves her behind. And then he meets... Isla Fisher, she's like this, this uh, intern there too, and she's like a cool, cool like alternative '90s chick, right? Who's like all like, yeah, whatever about stuff. And then Rachel Vice is like this lady who writes for the New Yorker, and she's all like, oh, I'm pretty highfalutin, and she's like with an older guy who's played by Kevin Klein, you know. And cool. She's kind of like, yeah, and so and he's like a, you know, a drunk, an old drunk, you know, famous political writer. So I'm going to say a few highlights, a few just non-plot-driven highlights of this, or some plot-driven, I don't know. We're, we're figuring out how this segment goes. Um, so a few <laughs> other things I took note of. So we both did our summaries, a few extra things. Um, the main guy in this uh, eventually does create a cream 
<laughs> that mimics pheromones that he rubs on the nerds and then the nerds get girls. But it's like such <laughs> such a minimal amount um, of this plot, even though they make it sound like the entire plot. Um, the main guy also quotes Kevin Costner's speech from Bill, Bull Durham, the I believe in like whatever, whatever. Do you know what I'm talking about? Yeah, he's like, I while. believe in like three hour long okay, kisses okay. and blah, blah, right. blah. Uh, he quotes that. Also, he references uh, the computer wore tennis shoes a lot and talks about how great Kurt Russell is. Interesting. And then um, the nerds end up becoming a rap group called the Goo Boys. And guess what? They save the radio station. Oh. And they get the girls. All right. And he makes his father proud. Shit. Um, so. So that's what I have for Body Waves. It was surprisingly bizarre and went in a bunch of different directions. And I was kind of like, I wasn't bored with it. Okay. You know, like, uh, didn't know what was going to happen next. There were a lot of boobs. Okay. So pretty um, raunchy. But they were incidental. Okay. So it wasn't like, we got to see these boobs. Right. It was more like, there are some boobs, but we've got to save the radio station. <laughs> that's, that's, a distinct, that's a good distinction. Yeah, and uh, I, the nerds had some really good, like, Three Stooges energy that I was into. And there was the one scene in the middle of it where they were like, we don't know what to do. Hey, let's just go windsurfing. And then it cut in footage of, like, professional windsurfers. <laughs> and then they were like, let's also go snowboarding. And then they cut in footage of professional snowboarders. What? And it was really bizarre and weird. Um, I think this is... It's it's an interesting one. I think if you're interested at all in my Ronchcom journey, you should check this one out. And there's like this really terrible rap song at the end that the Goo Boys make up. Um, so it was like kind of Revenge of the Nerds ish. It was a surprise. I'm so not gonna say it's great, but it uh, was something. So that's the Ronch. All right, give me some more some more about def definitely. Maybe. Okay, so my Rom does not have any boobs. <laughs> Not even incidental, because uh, it's PG thirteen. Yeah. So it's pretty. Uh, it's pretty. It's pretty tame in that. In that. But you know, it is. It does involve adult situations like falling in love, and falling in love with three different beautiful women. Are you gonna tell <laughs> us which one is the mom? Okay. So that's the thing about does, this movie. Does the mom come in at the end, and then you see which one it is? Yeah, but here's the thing. Okay, so the way this movie's built, and like it's also I've his journey. It's also his it. journey of becoming like a sort of disillusioned with politics and stuff because of like the whole Bill Clinton scandal, you know, yeah. in the '90s and stuff. And so, it, it gets into that a little bit too. So there's a little bit that's like, that's like kind of the the color of it, and that's kind of what makes it a little more interesting than it would be otherwise. Is that it's like okay, it's like addressing this character's growth and rise and fall through this other stuff from history uh the other interesting thing about it is like the storytelling aspect where he's telling the story and it keeps cutting back to her although at some point it becomes a little frustrating so i'm like oh right well which one's the mom and of course then when you find out which one the mom is you have to also remember the beginning of the movie the whole reason he's telling this story is because he's getting divorced from her oh no and so you're like oh right yeah so it turns out the mom is elizabeth banks you know, okay. the mom, so he'd married the high her. Sweetheart. Yeah, he'd married her, and you know, and then Rachel Weiss went off, and she she had a whole her whole fulfilling life or whatever. Yeah. Isla Fisher is obviously the one he's supposed to get with, right? The whole movie, and so when it turns out she's not the mom, you're like, wait a second, and then you go, oh no, wait, he's gonna get with her after, after you find out who the mom is. You know, you feel like the culmination of it is like when it reveals who the mom is. You go, oh story's done being told and you're like no because he's divorcing that lady he's divorcing that That's pretty lady that he's, and he's got to go get that with it's the because other he's pretty divorcing lady divorcing her yeah so abigail breslin's mom is elizabeth banks right so then you know then it's like him eventually hooking up with getting back together with isla fisher although there's this whole thing where she's collecting every copy of jane Eyre because this whole thing about her dad gave her a copy at some point he like wrote in a copy and then she lost it at some point and he's died and she's been searching for this copy of the book and so she buys every copy of of jane Eyre. that's insane that also, she can so she has a always, bookshelf of you it. go to any used bookstore there's so many copies of jane Eyre all the time he finds the one but then he goes to see her but then he sees that she has a boyfriend and then he like leaves and then he marries elizabeth banks and they have they have a little miss sunshine and then they then eight years later he that's all ended and he's like i'm gonna go see her again and he like 
goes to her and he's like gives her the book and she's like you found it and he's like yeah actually i found it like eight years ago and she's like get out that's fucking dick move to like hold on to this thing that you know is super right. important to me because your man Wait. your man part was hurt or whatever yeah you're waiting for uh, when you're single then little miss sunshine's like you have to go be with her now dad what are you gonna do so she drags her to like to like she the really other does woman. That. Yeah, she drags the other woman, and then they kiss and stuff. And, you know, it's that's what you want. If you, you, if you didn't end up with her at the end of the movie, you'd be like, well, that was disappointing. Maybe if more realistic. Want, um, but. If you want another rom-com that deals with uh, mysterious books and having to find them, you should watch Serendipity with, with John Cusack. Well, it's on my list. And, and I, you I know, think Kate Beckinsale. And you know I love a Cusack, so. I know. Is um, there a tagline on yours at all? There's a tagline. No, there's not. Oh, bummer. There's no tagline. I got uh, Ride the Big Ones, and I got Beaches, Blondes, and Buns under the hot Malibu sun. <laughs> this says no tagline. What a bummer. Dean Richards at WGN TV Chicago says the freshest romantic comedy in years. So uh, uh. that was in 2008. So you know, there have been fresher ones since then. I think that the clear winner here is Body Waves. Yeah, I also uh, think the clear winner is Body Waves as well. It was well. an unfair competition from the start. Uh, if, if you, you guys like... agree... <laughs> or disagree? Please let us know. You think the winner of the the first, the first uh, biweekly Ranch versus Rom <laughs> competition is. If you definitely maybe like Ryan Reynolds, Elizabeth Banks, Isla Fisher, Rachel Vice, or, or Little Brislin. Miss Sunshine, as <laughs> Abigail Breslin, you will be you will be mildly charmed by definitely maybe. And if you like <laughs> boobs, independent radio, uh, Kevin Costner speech in Bull Durham, and. Uh, Three Goop. Stooges comedy energy, you'll like body waves. Body waves. All right, there you go. Ranch versus Rom. For the first time for ever. For the first time ever, I'm going to go first. I think that'll be good, yeah. <laughs> uh, and my pick today is uh, I did a TV show actually last year that was, and this is a sort of a horror, another horror themed TV series, uh, and it is uh, The Brilliant Inside Number Nine. There have been six seasons of this, and we have five of them here. What, what about the sixth one? Uh, well, I'll tell you why. Because we had season one, and then, uh, or we had season one and two, maybe? Anyway, we had one or two of the seasons, and then I was re-watching these and watching the new season, and I realized we didn't have all of them, and so I got the other seasons for the store. So I got these while season six was airing. And so that's why we don't have season six yet, <laughs> is because uh, I hadn't gotten it for the story yet. It's an anthology show, um, and I say I say like sort of horror because a lot of them are are horror or like sort of thrillers. They almost always have a twist, um, but they're also also really funny. It's by uh, the dudes uh, Steve, Pem Steve Steve Pemberton and Reese Shearsmith who did uh, League of Gentlemen and Psychoville, uh, both of which I've never watched, but I have watched all of Inside Number 9 twice now. I'm not going to go into, like, each one, because, like I said, there's six episodes every season, and each one is, like, a different a different story. The thing is, the title's Inside Number 9, yeah. so every episode takes place in a location that's number 9. So it's an address or a warehouse or a thing, and it'll always be, like, they'll zoom in on the 9, and then it'll have the title. That's cool. Some of them are just uh, straight-up uh, horror. There's one about, like... The Witch Finders, you know, they did a great Halloween special that's like, if you are if you know Ghost Watches, if you're a fan of that kind of thing, it's totally like that. They did it live, and I don't know if they fooled how, if they fooled anybody, but it's like, a, it's like a similar kind of thing where they did it live, and they're doing, they're going like, here, we're going to do the Inside Number 9 uh, horror, you know, Halloween special, and then like, technical difficulties go wrong, and then it's like, keeps cutting to like, security footage of them and stuff around, the, you know, and then yeah. some, and then like flash into these things of like this footage of like this horrible accident that happened at this studio that they were like we're gonna shoot there and it's like so it's like this whole ghost thing um there's a great christmas special they did and i'm not gonna give away the uh the twist on any of these because that's like <laughs> half the fun is watching them going like what's the oh my god and that one has like a real that one has like a very fucked up like twist the whole time you're watching going like oh, okay this is okay see so it's like a commentary track over like this Christmas episode of a TV show. Are they all pal code? Then they're all pal. Yeah, they're all pal because you know it's a British show and it has not been released in the U.S. Uh, I, I don't know if it's even been screened anywhere here. Probably like BBC America, maybe or something. This is one of my favorite shows. Uh, the one that turned me on to it was uh, Leo, who works here, recommended 
the second episode of the first season, and it's uh, these these cat burglars trying to steal this painting from this house. It's like a silent movie. Like they have to be quiet because there's people in the house, and so there's music and there's sound and stuff, but they never talk. And so these cat burglars are Ooh, walking around. It's like that movie. Uh, Do you know what I'm talking about? That the noir crime movie where they rob a bank and it's completely silent for like 15 minutes. Rafifi? No. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, similar to that, but yeah, it's that same kind of thing where they're like, they're, but they're like sneaking around this house and like, and then all this other drama and stuff is happening with the people who live there, but then they're the two, like these two goofs who are the uh, cat burglars trying to steal this thing and there's gags with uh, dogs with like a big dog and a smaller dog and uh, it's really... Love gags with big and small dogs. It's, and then it has a dark twist. There's always like something that's like a little, a little fucked up. Have you seen the... In. What it kind of reminds me of. Have you seen the Duplass Brothers uh, Room... Is it Room 43? Yeah, that's a similar kind of thing. Kind of that same yeah, kind of yeah. premise. Except this is that's all like in that one in room. In that one room. And this yeah. is more just the numbers. The, yeah, yeah. The, and this is sort of like it could, ta- it could take place... But wherever, in the way the that it's like of some thing. of them are horror, some of them are dramas, and like all yeah. of them kind of are just a little dark. Yeah, and, and like so almost, I would, pro- I would probably, I love that show. I'd probably really like this. Yeah, you should check it out. Almost all of them are also comedies because these guys are they're funny dudes. So yeah. like, almost all of them, there's like some comedy in there too. But uh, yeah, I don't know. Inside Number Nine. If you haven't seen it, uh, check it out. It's a great weird dark comedy horror drama. <laughs> anthology show <laughs> and um if you don't have a region free player just a reminder we rent them we also sell them here at that's Scarecrow. true that's true I hate- all right the movie i chose as my first movie to talk about is 1977's uh the child Uh, which has a great cover from this era release. There's also another. I'm going to open it and show you guys the other cover. Sorry if this is loud because of the mic. But there's this <laughs> cover too, which is also cool. Um, all around great uh, art here. So this movie is directed by Robert Voskanian. Voskanlin. I don't know. I can't read my own handwriting. Um, but it's his only movie that he ever did. It's uh, made in 1977. May take place in 1930s. And um, this woman gets lost in the woods on her way to a house that she's going to become, like, the governess of. And she's going to, like, a nanny, basically. Um, And then when she finally gets past the creepy forest to the house, um, the kid that she's supposed to be taking care of is, like, a real creep. Her name's Rosalie, and she's, she's snotty and bratty, but she also, like, always sneaks out in the middle of the night to go to the cemetery. And everyone's like, where do you go? Like, why, why do you go to the cemetery? And she's like, oh, my friends are there. But she never kind of goes into it. So you're like, who is she meeting at the cemetery? We find out her friends at the cemetery are a bunch of, like, ghouls and goblins. Like, like zombie-esque creatures who do anything that Rosalie says. She's a creepy kid, not in the way that she's actually being, like, evil or whatever, but she has these monsters that basically do her will. So, um, mm, that's their, not good. their neighbors, um, some animals, and her family around her starts dying, and everyone knows it's Rosalie, but no one can really prove it because they never see the monsters. Wow. Um, this movie's super atmospheric in that 70s way. Um, it has a really cool, unsettling, like, kind of synthy piano score. Um... And there's a there's a lot of gore too. So it's not just atmospheric. It's like it's a goth a gothic kind of like haunted house movie. But then towards the end, it really ramps up when you actually see like the destruction that Rosalie is having her her graveyard friends do. <laughs> Um, there's a lot of eyeball removal. I know you love that. It's not even eyeball removal isn't what bothers me the most. It's, it's just, like the slight, like a uh, touch. A slice, yeah, touching eyeballs like, or whatever. The, that, like that it? bothers me more. <laughs> the eyeball, the eyeball, like eyeball splatter in like most gore movies doesn't bother me yeah. because it's usually because it's like pretty it's fake, very fake usually. Yeah. But like uh, there's no, a yeah, scene in is... Raw where like a guy licks somebody's somebody oh, licks God. somebody else's eye. I can't remember who at, at like a party. And yeah, this is less that like, and more like aftermath of like Fulci eyeball yeah, 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 stuff. Yeah. Cool. Um, this sounds great. I've never no, seen this. It's I can't really good. I, I feel like it's a it's a very overlooked yeah. kind of seventies uh, gem. There's also a scene where she has a Halloween party and there's like jack lanterns and shit. So it's like a perfect movie for the season. There, the the characters in this movie are great. Like her, 
the little girl's father is just like a grumpy old man who's just very stagey. And then there's this old woman who lives down the, like, across the forest who just lives alone with her dog. I guess it was like a big stage actress and then this was her only movie. So it's kind of like low budget, but like they do it right. Like you can tell a lot of care went into this movie. Cool. Yeah. So I think more people should see the child. All right. So, uh, well, this is uh, now going to be one of my favorite uh, horror movies. And I've talked about James Gunn on here before. And it is uh, James Gunn's Slither. Love it. One of my favorite horror movies of the last, like, I don't know, 20 years. If you were to ask me what's exactly like the kind of horror movie that you like, it's I'd be Slither. like, well, it's Slither. <laughs> like, it's honestly like w- hits every note. It's funny. It's uh, it's really gross. It's so gross. It has fucking amazing critters in it. It's got a great cast. Uh, I don't know. It's just it's really it's the really cool. The pacing is perfect. The pacing is perfect. It's I love movies about uh, also about like weird critters from space and stuff. Also the, has that small community feel where yeah, everyone knows each yeah. other. The special effects are awesome in it. Like they're just yeah. so cool and like inventively gross and shit. So Slither is about a guy played by uh, Michael Rooker, who is this awful dude. Uh, and uh, he he plays this sort of shitty piece of shit husband piece guy. of shit. And hey, second appearance of Elizabeth Banks tonight. Whoa, uh, are you a Banks head? I guess I am. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, Elizabeth Banks is his is his wife, and he's just he's just a shitty dude. He's out like about to cheat on his wife one night in the woods, and he runs across this weird little uh, <laughs> meteorite that is shot that was in the woods, and he's like, "What's going on here?" He gets shot with like a spear of grossness and then uh, he starts kind of turning into a space monster. At some point there he impregnates a woman who turns huge. Something's wrong with me. And then there's all these tiny little worms. It's just super gross. I featured, this is one of the movies that I wrote in my uh, body horror recommendations because it's like, it's up there and I feel like enough people have not seen it, you know? Yeah, it's weird, especially as given how uh, James, how James Gunn has become kind of one of the major, like a huge, like big blockbuster directors with the, the Guardians of the Galaxy and Suicide Squad and stuff and like how... But like this is this is totally a little still overlooked. I mean, it is R-rated, so it's not like as accessible for maybe the fans of those movies. But like, it is made for the people who watch those movies too, because those are also movies I like. But it's made for people like that, where you're like, if you're like some 15 year old and you're like, I want to see just the fucking grossest horror movie <laughs> I can see. It's Point a good party the t- movie too. If you yeah. have like a group of people, I over did. At your house. Last you time did. I, I showed it with you, and I, we watched Attack oh. of the Beast Creatures, and I this. didn't. I didn't say. Oh, for you didn't say for this, and they showed this, and right, everybody was fun. like, uh, was like grossed out by it. Wasn't but, it like two o'clock when you showed that too? It was like middle midday. Of the day. Yeah, well, we did like a brunch. We did a horror brunch. I love a horror yeah. brunch. But we put it on the TV in the store, and it never fails to have somebody walk by it and go what like, "Oh my god, what is that? It's so gross." I don't know what else to say about it. Uh, Nathan Fillion's great. Uh, it's got one of my a line I think of all the time. I was gonna uh, ask you to do. I'm like, what's the best line? It has a line. It has a line I think of all the time, which is Greg Henry, where he says, uh, "Where is the Mr. Pib? I told your secretary to pack Mr. Pib. It's the only Coke I like." Goddamn Brenda exploding like a water balloon. The worms driving my friends around like they're goddamn skin cars. People are spitting acid at me, turning you into kind of cheese, and now there's no fucking goddamn Mr. Pib. Jesus Christ, Jack, let me get right on it. Mr. Pib, too. Uh, What's the last time you had a Mr. Pib? And if you if you watch the Suicide Squad, uh, Nathan Fillion, who plays the main character, and this is the sheriff, he plays a guy. Uh, called TDK in the uh, Suicide Squad, and at the beginning when he's got one of his hero shots, he's drinking, he's drinking, oh a, he's drinking God. a pib, and I'm like, and I watched a whole, I watched a whole video where this guy's pointing out all these Easter eggs. He didn't get that one, and I'm like, that's a fucking reference to Slither. 
If you're watching, guy, we fucking found one. Yeah. He found one. Yeah, internet site. If you guys want to send us a, a case of Pib Extra, because I don't think they just sell Mr. Pib anymore. I think it's all Pib Extra. It's all Pib Extra, yeah. Uh, you can send it to us. But Slither is just a, a bunch of... in. Uh, it's. It's funny, it's, so it's gross, it's great. I think all three great. of us love that movie. No, all three of us. I mean, it's all great. three of us actually fucking love just that movie. Like, <laughs> it's like, uh, you know, it's just, for, uh, again, for me, it's like, well, how can every movie can't just have everything in it? Well, Slither does. <laughs> <laughs> all right, so the movie I'm going to talk about is this movie called November from 2017. This is a Estonian movie um, by the director Rainer Sarnet or Sarne. I don't know how to pronounce his name. It was the submission for the best uh, foreign film for the Academy Awards in 2017 as well. This movie is pretty indescribable, very strange and weird, um, but it's one of the best movies I think I've seen in a very, very long time. Every shot of this movie is absolutely gorgeous. It's black and white, just beautiful. I could have like uh, taken a picture of every single shot and thrown it on Instagram if I wanted to be like that girl. I went into this thinking it would be more of a horror because I, I got it from a list. So I was like, oh, I'll just I'll watch this It's one of my horror challenges or whatever but it's it's more of like a very dark like fairy tale kind of like a folk like a folk dream nightmare thing there's a lot going on in it it takes place in a really small poor village in rural estonia and um it follows these villagers um as they try to basically like trick death and like the black plague into like skipping over their town so they do like different things like they disguise themselves they like wear like pants over their heads so that black plague won't think they have like mouths and faces to like ingest the disease and they do all this other like these weird like like potions and like different like you know, basically different spells to, like, save their village. At the same time, they have these creations that they make out of different tools. They're called, I think they're called Kratz. Kratz uh, will do all of your work for you and um, could even, like, steal livestock from other people's farms and basically help you succeed through the harsh winter. But in order for them to do that, you have to sell your soul to the devil so that the devil will give a soul to the Kratz. Some villagers are tricking the devil by, like, pretending to sign the contract in blood, but it's really they're signing it in, like, uh, berry juice or something like that. Follows these two teenagers, Hans and... What is her name? Lena? Lena's in love with Hans, but Hans is in love with the beautiful, rich Baroness that visited their one castle that they have in the village. The Baroness is beautiful, rich. She also sleepwalks. And each night she goes out to the edge of the castle and someone always like saves her at the last minute. Hans is like obsessed with her. Lena is in love with Hans and is like, I, I really want to be the girlfriend of Hans, but the local witch was like, you have to kill the Baroness basically. And she's like, I can't do that because then Hans will die of sadness. So there's this whole like unrequited love bit going on. She eventually tries to trick Hans into thinking she is the Baroness by wearing this dress that she got there's like so much going on in this in this movie but it's like all so like ethereal and like very like dream logic and like ghostly and disorienting and like a folk noir it's it's just like gorgeous i keep going back to fairy tale but that's like kind of what it is like you do this this happens uh this is your goal but in order for this to happen, you must sacrifice this, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. But then it has this weird, like, otherworldly, like, these machine monsters, and then the mm-hmm, devil, right. like, with your soul and everything. At the same time, like, it's a commentary on, like, class. What these villagers have to give up in order to even survive, or to even, like, have their family continue their, like, heritage and their, their line, you know, down. Yeah. It's like um, a great stark black and white photography, too. Yeah, it's, like breathtakingly gorgeous i wish i'd seen this on the big screen but um so uh, yeah i there's like no other way at the end uh the the teenage boy wants to create his own crap so he like creates a snowman and he tries to trick the devil and then the devil's like uh you're trying to trick me so i'm actually going to take your soul and give the soul to the crap and the snowman since it's made of snow, it can't do any work for him, so it just 
tells him of all of the different love and like poetry he's witnessed because he's water so he's gone through the wow. whole world witnessing the greatest loves and the greatest losses i swear i watched this but i maybe i didn't watch the whole thing i expected it to be kind of like slow paced but it's actually like it was it was really enchanting and mesmerizing like i was hooked the entire time i don't know if this guy the director has done anything else i think he might have done a couple other things but this is like the big one really check this one out i had never heard anyone talk about it before and it's like my new favorite so our dog movie today is we didn't know anything about this movie going in no nope. it was on lists of dog movies it's on vhs only it is a movie called mongrel From 1982, directed by Robert A. Burns. Yeah. His only movie he ever directed. Yeah. It's not much of a movie in general, but it's like hardly a dog movie at all. And I think at the point we both watched it, we were, it was like that kind of thing where we were like, fuck, well. Here it is. We can't. It was no time to do like another dog movie. Starts out dro so. dog, kind of dog strong though. It's like Snow White and the Seven Dwarfs in this fucking house. <laughs> Always well, one lady and a bunch of dumbasses. There's, there's two ladies, and then there's like, right. Anyway, you guys want to know who lives in this house? Yeah, name them. The two women women are Sharon and Turquoise, and then there's Toad, whose real name is Richard, Jeremy, who goes by Jerry, Woody, Ike, Kenny, who just moved in, Leon, and then this old dog. Who is like a wolfhound kind of dog? Right. Right. Yeah. So they treat him like shit. They he's uh, he's Ike's dog. Right. He's and Ike is the guy who watches the war movies really loud. Yeah. Okay. He changes his dog outside and keeps him on a chain. It's like just not how you treat a dog. And so no. this dog looks is barking all the time and is very violent sounding. And one of the first things anyone says is basically this movie starts by Kenny. Um, He's moving in. And so Jeremy, or Jerry, I guess, is showing him the ropes. And Jerry's, like, the nicest one out of everyone. And he's like, man, one day that dog's going to break that chain and hurt someone bad. Like, that's, like, the first thing they say about yeah. the dog. And then he, like, shows Kenny his room in this house where the, all these people live. It's like a yeah, All it's these, like, like mid-30s guys uh, live. Yeah, it's... <laughs> It's a boarding house. I don't know. Um, Woody loves p playing pranks. He's the dick one. He's also yeah. uh, the guy from X-Files. Mitch Pileggi, who plays uh, Skinner on X-Files. Yeah. But from 1982. <laughs> so he is like the the rowdy one who he plays pranks like the, he hit a bunch of... Hubcaps. Hubcaps. Surely Jack didn't do this. Um, in a closet... And so when J Jerry was, like, showing Kenny the room... They all fall They out. all fall out. And then Jerry's just like, that was Woody. He, yeah. do he does that. He does <laughs> like, he does pranks He like does this. pranks. He'll do pranks. He'll do There's pranks. a prank later that... Uh, goes wrong. On Kenny that goes very wrong. They all have their unique personalities, kind of. I mixed a few of them up a few times, but I managed to write all their names down. <laughs> and uh, yeah. Kenny starts... Uh, falling in love with Sharon and Ike used to like Sharon and uh no one likes Ike's dog because he's barking a bunch I, yeah Ike's dog uh who doesn't even get a name I don't think this movie is so not about the dog uh <laughs> it breaks and there's another dog that it's even less about oh yeah it breaks free of the chain and attacks Leon no no toad oh, oh, so Woody shoots the dog and kills the dog. Yeah. So that's where Which is everything like, starts. I mean, at that point, it seems like, yeah, that seems like the right move. I mean, I don't want to see a dog get shot. And also, you don't see the dog get shot. Don't treat your dog like this and then act like you're surprised the dog is going to be violent. Yeah, I mean, this is a type of movie where nobody acts in a way that people do. Yeah. So what do you expect? <laughs> um, 
All shot in this one house in Austin, Texas. The movie on paper is like admirable. Like it's a low budget movie. With, uh, you mm. assume all these guys are friends probably and they just like shoot it at this house and it's like kind of a little slice of low budget like regional filmmaking. But they it's... did get like the old actor because they got Aldo Ray to play the landlord, the owner of the house who oh, shows yeah. up a few times. So he they, did great. That, they got that. He thing did where, good. And he's like, but they got that thing where you like get one old name actor from the past. Yeah to do two scenes in your movie that he shot, you know, I'm sure on the same day. Huh. Look at this. I rent them a perfectly good house and this is the way they treat it. The tensions in this house run high because Kenny is falling in love with Sharon. Ike used to date Sharon and still wants to date Sharon. Ike's mad at Woody for shooting his dog. Uh, and then there's, like, all this other drama with the remaining, like, real-world cast of this fucking house. What he gets an adorable he... golden retriever puppy that he just chains in the, in the <laughs> cellar. In the basement of this house. Like, these people don't know how to have dogs. There's like, oh, isn't he cute? Cute my ass. This guy's gonna put old Eisenhower's dog to shame when he grows uh, up. <laughs> look at those teeth, huh? Don't do that, Woody. He doesn't like it. Oh, he loves it, don't you, boy? Huh? Yeah. This old... And Ike's pissed because Ike's like, the landlord said we could only get have one fucking dog. And Kenny's like, well, it doesn't sound like the landlord comes around that often. Right. And then he's like, well, when he does, like... But the thing about Ike and, and Ike and Woody were like sort of pals. But then uh, Ike, Woody shoots his dog and then Ike's like, I don't like you. Yeah. But then all of a sudden, they're going to play a prank on Kenny. Because Kenny Ike is likes, hitting on Sharon. And Ike, so Ike teams up with Woody again and they <laughs> seems like they're friends. And you're like, didn't this guy just shoot your dog like five fucking minutes ago? Before they play this prank on Kenny, I think before they... Something happens to the puppy. Um, if, is, is it? It's before yeah, because he or tell, after. because he tells Kenny about it. Jerry hears this crazy growling noise in the middle of the night, and he's like, "What the fuck?" And everyone and everyone is like, "Jerry's scared of dogs because he got attacked by a dog when he was little." Right. So Woody, <laughs> there's there's like way too many characters in this movie. There's no need. There's like three <laughs> characters that you could just cancel out of this movie. It doesn't even matter. Uh, so Jerry, true. fuck. I'm sorry. Woody <laughs> goes oh. downstairs to the basement. And finds that his new puppy has been just mutilated. Destroyed. <laughs> <laughs> it's like it's it doesn't it, even I mean, it's laughing. not recognized. No, I'm laughing because you cannot recognize this as a dog anymore. It is, was it was just like a a pile some... of shit. <laughs> This is like, this pile like a pile, pile of stuff. like some ground beef with some fake blood poured like, on it or it's something. A pile of stuff. I, like, I didn't even I didn't even know what I was looking at until he was like, "Oh, my puppy!" And then I was like, "Oh, <laughs> like oh, that's bad." But you don't see it happen or anything. So you don't even and you hear have, it. And the movie is so not a dog movie that you have no attachment to this puppy. Oh, no. no offense to the puppy. You don't even puppy. know the names of these dogs. There's a puppy he chained in the basement that's in like two scenes before that, and he's like, "My puppy, something." It's a Woody my puppy. like bursts upstairs like, "I'm gonna fucking kill Ike. Like, I am going to kick his ass. I can't believe he killed." my dog because his dog got killed i been at work kenny's kenny's like oh god like what's happening now with this this drama house that i've like entered into or whatever like i just want to hang out with sharon for some oh, reason boy. woody and ike decide to put all that behind them and just <laughs> play a prank on kenny because uh ike is jealous yeah so they play this prank where they're like they tell they say that sharon's they, waiting in they his leave room. notes for them and sharon leaves and so she's gone but then woody uh, he comes home and they're like sharon's waiting in your room for you and then he goes in up her there, nightgown in her nightgown he's like in my room and so he and goes and he goes in there room. he's stripping the, he's it's stripping dark. up he's like "Ooh, it's dark i'm gonna go get in bed and then and he's like what's that smell yeah then he opens the sheet and it's like a dead and it, it? it's it's I don't you can't even tell what it Ike's, is. It's Ike's dead dog oh. that they dug up from the backyard and put there in oh, his yeah. dog. It's like his dog with maggots all over his face and stuff. And, and yeah. so that's the, Kenny, that's the last and that that is the last dog you're dogs. gonna see we're in done this with movie. Dogs. That's the last Kenny dog you're gonna see in this the movie. the fuck out and uh runs over to the door. It's like locked, they like locked him in or whatever. And then he, like, trips over this old lamp, trips over, like, a plant that spills water on the yeah. ground, and then ends up electrocuting himself to death. <laughs> That's also, for me, the last fun part of the movie, because that was, like, uh, totally unexpected. Very Cause, unexpected. Because they do, they, do, they do posit 
He was our main character. Him as like the main character because he first moves in and he's like the guy and he's like, okay, and then he Dude, dies. Yeah, uh, he Robert dies. A. Burns pulled a Hitchcock with that one and just <laughs> killed our main character if right we, away. Well, not right away, but, but a while like, at a, 30 away, minutes at in. some point in the movie. Um, So they're uh, like, oh, fuck, we like actually didn't mean to kill Kenny. This sucks. Oops. Everyone's freaking out. Jerry's especially freaking out because Kenny is like the only one who was ever nice to him. Mm-hmm. Then the movie just, just keeps happening. It just keeps happening. Jerry, Jerry has, keeps he, he has, hearing he growls. Has like, he says they're nightmares, but he's hearing like things at night of like, you know, the cop, the, the, this cop comes, there's this detective. This cop's so this tired. Lazy. He's like, you excuse me, I have to try to locate a young lady who stabbed her father 18 times with a butcher knife. And that is most definitely murder. <laughs> yeah, because oh, because Ike ends up dead in the front yard, and you're like, oh, and there's a growling, and so you're like, oh, is it a dog? What's going on? Jerry's having these visions or these hearing these sounds. At, meanwhile, everyone's trying to move out. A character named Leon who just doesn't do anything. Like what? <laughs> He has no storyline. <laughs> He's just there. There's a character, Leon, and then Toad. I guess Toad gets attacked by the dog, but he doesn't really do anything either. No, no, and Then no. Turquoise is just, like, the hippie girl who's, like, a She's girlfriend with... of Woody. Right, right, yeah. And, like, they have, like, a whole thing where they're, like... They have a cool attic setup, though. They do have a pretty good I attic I like set. their bedroom. They're, that's kind of the best room in the house, Yeah, I totally. So there's some killings. Yeah, I stopped even taking notes. I like, was, like, the murders. It's, then it's just... But then it's just sort of like a, a slasher film where you're, like, who's gonna die next? Or and are they gonna die next? And then it ends up being, like, Jerry's, like, freaking out every time something happens. And everyone's, right. like, Jerry, you gotta leave your room. He's, like, I can't do it. Also, it looks like the, the, the dog was in my room or the animal was in my room. And no one really believes him. And then it turns out that Jerry is this is the animal that is attacking and jerry's people. the killer and he's yeah. like it's not a dog it's jerry and he growls and shit he's either a werewolf or he's just uh possessed by a wolf or he's just like psycho and has has become what he believes to be a dog yep uh and he just kills everyone yeah he kills everyone uh he doesn't kill Sharon until Sharon or he tries to kill Sharon yeah. though because he like tries to kiss her and Sharon's like whoa we were just friends like I wasn't leading you on at all and he's like all oh, girls are the same he does that whole like oh god you led me on I'm gonna fucking yeah. kill you you led me on I never led you anywhere you just misunderstood you said we could live together I didn't mean not like that you were just making fun of me then he tries to kill her and yeah. she like I don't even I think I blacked out what happened he just she just escapes uh, she's, he's about to kill her, and then the, uh, oh. the landlord shows up. Shoots him. And he shoots him in the back, and then he goes, God damnedest thing I ever saw. And then the credits roll. End of movie. So, yeah, the movie <laughs> was, like, it wasn't a dog movie. We were tricked. It and I mean, was, it, I guess it was interesting in the way that, like, when else would I have ever even tried to see this movie, or, like, anyone would ever see this movie, because, oh, also this cover? I know. I know. Well, the cover me? is rad. The cover's fucking tight, but this is nothing. There's nothing. I mean, at I didn't, all. and I didn't expect that because that's like a the three-headed mm, dog of hell, right? No, but that's cool though. Um, here's the thing: is that it's also it's in our nature run amok section at Scarecrow, so that's another another trick. And it's not whoever put it there. That's where it. That's probably where they thought it should go. And apparently, that, like, according to the back, you know, it does involve a a, a killer that you think. Is maybe uh, like a like a zombie dog, right? It also, but has like my, at the end, it just turns out to be a fucking it's guy. Just Jerry. It does feature my favorite tagline. Yeah. Okay. What is it? Uh, mysterious noises coming from the house. What could it be? <laughs> <laughs> I'll tell you one thing. I know it's not do- a dog. It's not a dog. It's not a dog for sure. The, do- the two dogs in this movie were horribly abused and then murdered. <laughs> yeah, that I really mean, sucks. I mean, not in real life. In the the. The, oh, the, I'm sure they were fine in the fiction. Life. I'm sure they were like, I'm sure all these guys in this movie were like buds and they were nice. They're yep. not, and those were like their actual dogs that they like hung out with or whatever. Absolutely. So I'm sure they had fun. And for that, you know, good for them. I can't recommend Mongrel less enough. So how many paws? I give it zero paws. I'm going to also give it I'm zero gonna paws. I'm going to give it zero paws. It's because it turns out it wasn't a dog movie. We were tricked. This was a, this was a horrible Halloween trick on us. At least the dog was father, not a treat. at least the dog father was about a dog. The dog father was, yeah. And also, a, we will never stop talking about the dog father. Terrible movie. Here's him eating spaghetti again. 
Every episode, every now. Episode. Every episode. Woo. You never. You gotta watch the whole thing, though. You never know when it's gonna pop you up. You never know. You don't know. So yeah, if you've seen Mongrel, <laughs> let us know your thoughts. You probably haven't. You don't need to. It's honestly fine. We have something better up next. We I, do. I've never seen it, but I've heard it was uh, better. This, yeah, this is a good movie. I, I haven't seen it in a long time, so I can't say how great, but uh, Don Johnson starring in A Boy and His Dog. <laughs> A Boy and His Dog, rated R. Based on the Harlan Ellison stories, and I think the screenplay Ooh. by Harlan Ellison. It says the year's uh, 2024. Oh no, written by, it was written and directed by L.Q. Jones, but it's based on Harlan Ellison's uh, story. Yeah, it's a post-apocalypse movie. 2024, that's only in Holy shit. three years. That's so <laughs> insane. That's so close. Well, hey, we'll watch this and see what's going to happen to us in three years. So, uh, yeah, so check out check, check it next time for a dog movie, A Boy and His Dog. <laughs> All right, we just got a little news flash. Yeah, Rich, dun, 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 Rich was dun, reading dun, dun. us a glowing review of Mongrel. I disagree with the the reviewer's view of of the quality of Mongrel. Yeah, um, it's not a good movie. No, the, and uh, but when I was like, oh, Robert, Robert A. Burns, A. Burns, didn't even direct anything else. He only directed Mongrel. That is true, but. That wasn't all he did. <laughs> no, Ma- he was before before Mongrel. He was a set decorator, set designer, uh, art dec- art art director, art director, art director on uh, like Texas Chainsaw Massacre, The Hills Have Eyes, The, the Howling. Howling, and so and so. Look, I'm not. We're, we weren't throwing Robert A. Burns under the bus entirely. Yeah, we just think Mongrel's not a good movie, and it's certainly for art. For <laughs> we love those other movies that we just listed, yeah. <laughs> yeah. and like we those just want to clarify that. Damn, like Robert A. Burns is a great art director. Seriously. But Mongrel wasn't good. Mm mm. And but we do want to acknowledge his other work and other like iconic pieces of of horror history. So, just a quick addendum before so, yeah. we go out at, <laughs> before we leave here. <laughs> news. Okay. News flash. News flash. Done. News flash. Done. done. So uh. So that's all we have today for the episode number twenty six. That's it. Episode twenty six. Um, in the bucket. In the bucket. Nothing in empty. here. Nothing in here but stickers but and a bunch of other stickers. stuff. Stickers. We need to put on the sticker. Um. Shelf. Remember to email us vvetscarecrow dot com. Yep. Uh, ask us for recommendations. Yeah. Ask us any questions. Send about us the recommendations. Store. Send us recommendations. Tell us what you want us to do. If you have a segment where you're like, you guys should do this thing. Yeah. Uh, tell us <laughs> what you like about our show, and if you've watched any of the movies we've we've talked about, or yep. send us uh, Halloween pictures of your dogs or cats or you <laughs> for fun. Again. Um, visit the store if you're in the Seattle area. We're open. You just have to wear a mask. Mm-hmm. Um, we're in Seattle in the U District. And follow us on all the stuff. Follow us on all the stuff. Uh, we've we got the all the links, links below. below. Check out Scarecrow Radio, our podcast. Check out Soundtrack Cinema with Mark Steiner. Check out uh, Art House of the Fart House, which had a new one on the live stream. Oh, and yesterday. so there may be more. There may that may be coming back. There may be more in the works. Yeah. Um, uh, and yeah. And yeah, look at uh, on my letterbox. There's the list. We'll probably link the list below. Mm-hmm. Of all the movies that we've talked about here on the show, so you can see. Um, any any gaps in your viewing that you want to you know complete yep and yeah that's pretty much it so uh yeah we'll see you next time uh viva physical media Media. Bye. bye bye bye